the homiletic directory and various church documents in the Second Vatican Council have presented a renewed vision of the homily. It describes what the church wants from its homilis, what it wants from a homily, but it doesn't prescribe the specific ways to do that. There are many decisions that the preacher needs to make as the best way for him to reach those outcomes. Those ways will be based on his own personality, his own gifts, his own training, what is suitable for him. One of those decisions is whether or not to use a text at the ambo. The church does not make any clear prescriptions about this, and some preachers work from a text very well. But various preachers at different times have made their own case for their own decisions on what they are doing in terms of how they preach at the ambo. Cardinal Newman, for example, in The Idea of the University, makes a strong case against bringing up a text and reading from it at the ambo. He says reading is not preaching and preaching is not reading. And his basis for that argument is lies in his motto that he wants his preaching to be core at core loquidor, heart preaching to heart. This is something that has come into various church documents in modern times, and especially in the writings of Pope Francis himself. But clearly what he is talking about is someone who reads a text, as opposed to having a text in front of him and preaching from the text to the congregation. Others prefer to use notes, having basic notes, a skeleton outline in front of them so that they don't lose their way and so discover a certain freedom in preaching that way. Certainly, in all of this, the Church is asking for preachers who preach conversationally, who preach directly, who engage the congregation, and do not separate themselves in, uh, from the congregation through a text, which in some ways is a fence. But then other preachers preach without a text at all. They preach without notes. That can be a scary decision. It's important to know, however, what it means and what it doesn't mean. What it doesn't mean is not having a text at all. Many homiletic writers and preachers who advocate preaching without notes make a strong point that it is important to write out the text of the homily first from beginning to end so that the preacher finds all the words he needs and knows that he can find all the words that he needs. The fact that is one thing the Church is very clear about, that it wants the preachers to prepare fully, to prepare over a number of days. This I like to call as horizontal preparation instead of uh, vertical preparation, a concentration in one day. More about that in an upcoming video. But if it does not mean not writing out a full text, what does preaching without notes actually mean and what does it entail? Let me speak from personal experience, a personal decision I made. For many years, I preached with a text, a full text, right up at the ambo. But then, after reading several convincing arguments about stepping away from a text, one of them being Joe Webb's uh, excellent book, Preaching Without Notes, I decided to take the plunge. It was scary. Going up to the ambo without notes felt like stepping off into the abyss. But as I got used to it, I discovered some important things. There were some important benefits that came out of it. These benefits were that I was able to achieve in my own way what the church was asking for me or asking from me as a preacher. The homily became more focused, more uh, uh, precise on one particular point as the, hom as the church has been asking for. The homily became therefore briefer because I couldn't remember that many things. The, com the homily became more conversational because I was not reading from a prepared text that had been written out in the way that I would have written an essay at the seminary or at a university. And a very important development I discovered was that the homily became much more full of images because the way I was remembering the homily was through a series of pictures in my head. So how do we do that? If we decide we are going to speak freely, but have a prepared text, but not bring that prepared text up to the ambo, how do we do it? Do we memorize it? 
certainly memorization is a possibility. But one of the dangers of memorization is that the delivery becomes mechanical, as memorized text often is. Another difficulty with memorization is that if for some reason the preacher gets knocked off track, it can be very, very hard to get that train back on track again. So what's the solution? Well, one solution that I've found helpful and that very other, uh, various other preachers have found helpful is the use of something called the Memory Palace. The Memory Palace was championed by Father Matteo Ricci, a, a Jesuit missionary into China in the 16th century. In China, there, were, uh, there was the practice of uh, national exams, and one got a, uh, a government post one became a magistrate, one became a governor, through demonstrating excellence in these exams. Theoretically, it was a way to have a level playing field and to open access to uh, government positions to everyone, not just from um, handing it down in aristocratic families. So the Chinese were very interested when uh, Father Matteo Ricci, who was teaching them various um, uh, things that the West had developed in terms of art and astronomy and so on, also brought forward something called a memory palace, something that made it easier to remember all of the kinds of um, pieces of information that had to be memorized for these very difficult, very intensive national exams. The memory palace was not invented by Father Ricci. It actually comes from, um, from ancient Greece. In ancient Greece, there was a fire and um, everyone had, uh, had, had perished in this fire except one. And that person, that poet, Simonides, um, was able to remember and identify everybody uh, in, in the fire because he remembered where they had been sitting, who had been on one's right and who had been one's on, le on one's left. And the idea was that human memory works much better with geography. I can lecture for an hour to someone and give all kinds of information. But then if you walk away from that lecture, it can be in an hour's time or two hours time, um, possible to remember a few points, but many of them will have got lost. And yet, if I ask that same person to describe the house they grew up in or some place that they are familiar with, they can describe in great detail the steps and the doorways and the turns and the corridors, even what was on the walls. So, because geography tends to s stick in our memory. So, what the ancient Greeks, uh, Greeks developed and what uh, Father Matteo Ricci used in his teaching in China was the idea of pinning ideas, pinning what you want to remember to geographical locations. Let's give an example. If it's, for example, the, priest, uh, the Feast of the Holy Family, well, Perhaps in the homily, the first thing the preacher wants to speak about is the Holy Family itself and, and how we venerate the Holy Family. And maybe the way he remembers that is, well, there's the Christmas creche, which is right there underneath uh, a Christmas tree inside the church. So in his mind, he chooses a place, perhaps his own home, and he puts a picture, an image of that Christmas creche on the steps leading up to his house. If, in fact, he wants to refer to Pope Paul VI, who, when he was in Israel, spoke about the school of the, of the Holy Family that was in Nazareth, maybe he has a picture in his mind of Pope Paul VI uh, holding that uh, creche on the steps. The next thing, perhaps, in that homily is that from there, from the ideal of the Holy Family, the preacher then wants to speak about our families and the relationships and the dynamics in families and what we can learn from the Holy Family. So then perhaps he puts on his front door, now he's gone up the steps, he puts, uh, he hangs a picture, a Norman Rockwell picture of an ideal family all together and all in harmony. But then the preacher wants to move on to the realities, recognizing that there are so many in the congregation who are in fractured families, many people who live alone, people who may, by hearing all of this wonderful talk about families, start, may have started to feel guilty. They may think of themselves as failures. 
So the preacher now wants to turn to the pressures on the family in the modern world. And so when he speaks about that, he, remember, he puts in his mind at the foot of the door the daily newspaper, and on the daily newspaper there is a headline perhaps of family in crisis or something else that he wants to remember. From there, he then wants to move to a hint that is in perhaps the uh, uh, liturgical texts of that day, perhaps the collect, perhaps the closing prayer, perhaps uh, one of the antiphones. And it, perhaps it has something to do with recognizing that the um, uh, that we are all a family in the church. There is a Catholic family, and we are part of the family of God. Beginning to move to an idea that if even if we are in less than perfect families or separated from our families, we are not without family. That we have this church family, this family of the saints. So. He opens the door, and uh, on the hall, hall table, there is a copy of the uh, missal for that Sunday, and it's opened either to, to, to whatever that text, the antiphone or the collect, or whatever, whatever it might be. From there, he might be then moving to an image or an idea that comes out of one of the readings or of the responsorial psalm, and then he has an image connected with that, which then he places in another place in the house, and so on, and so on, and so on. When it comes then to preaching, he walks up into the ambo, and in his mind, he walks through his house. He walks up that stairs, and he sees Pope Paul VI holding the uh, uh, Christmas crèche in his hands. He comes to the front door and sees that painting of Norman Rockwell. He looks down and sees the newspaper. He goes into the house and sees the open missile on the hall table turn to a text of the day. From there, he goes to the next place, perhaps the living room, or it's, the, it's on the coffee table. There is a, a, an image of something that comes out of the text for that day. And so on, and so on. He goes through the entire uh, uh, walk in his home, and now he's strolling through, in his mind, the entire homily. In this way, the preacher is making the idea homily, uh, idea perfect. He's moving from idea to idea to idea and is not being concerned that the homily is word perfect, that it that is mechanically clear, but rather that he is moving from the ideas, from the various moves of the homily. That means originally when he writes the homily out uh, in his preparation, that he breaks the homily down into sections and finds a strong image that can go for each of those sections. If the preacher cannot find an image, for a particular section. That may be an indication to him that that section is too theoretical or that it needs something to ground it to make it more concrete and there is some writing that he might have to do there. It's a scary thing to do but it's, it has many uh, benefits to it and the preachers will find it a valuable practice. Using the memory palace is one effective, one effective way to preaching simply, to preaching freely.